Coming up on today's Locked On Senators, after 10 months of sale, finally, the team will change hands. Are changes coming with it? And it's a Wednesday, so we have a Sense Central citizen. Today, we welcome on Matt. And if you've been following along, we're counting down our organizational value rankings. We are at a very interesting tier, young up-and-coming defensemen. It's tier seven on our list. This is the Locked On Senators podcast. It's your team every day. Your Locked On Senators, your daily podcast on the Ottawa Senators. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Jake Sanderson, and you're listening to Locked On Senators Podcast. I'm Tim Stützle, and you're listening to the Locked On Senators Podcast. Welcome inside episode 864 of the Locked On Senators Podcast. I'm Ross Levitan on the outskirts of enemy territory in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Alongside Brandon Pillar up in the Blue Mountains, a reminder that you can like and subscribe wherever you download your podcast. We are also free and available on YouTube. You can follow the show on social media at Send Central on Twitter and LockedOn.Senators on Instagram. Today is Wednesday, August 30th, and Pilsy, we are one day away from being in the month that Senators Hockey returns. There we go. We're getting there. I'll, you know, that's a bit of a stretch, Ross, but I will take it. Hey, if you're listening to this a couple days late, we're already there. Hockey's <laughs> back. Woo! Hockey's back. Let's go. And we know that the rookie camp starts on September 13th. The first game is September 15th. We will lead you right into that. A few of the players we're going to discuss today are going to take part in that event. And it's almost a shame. We'll get it sooner rather than later. But like Detroit's already put out their rookie camp roster. I'm curious to see oh. where the line is drawn. But I can report that Tyler Clevin will be there. No surprise. But Tyler Clevin will be participating in the rookie tournament this season. Before we get to the up-and-comers who are on our, our list of organizational value rankings and our Sun Central Citizen, there's been a lot of smoke over the last couple of days about what's going to happen when Michael Anlauer is in official control of the Senators. We know he's signed off on the moves throughout the summer. There's no way that money that's going to be coming out of his pocket wasn't discussed with him before the pen ink was dry. A, a five-year the- deal on a free agent goalie, the new owner is going to have uh, at least some say into that. Has to, especially when the seller is staying on as a 10% shareholder. You want to have a good relationship there. No surprises necessary. But are fans in for a surprise, Pilsy? When the keys are handed over, do you expect immediate sweeping changes through the business side, the hockey ops side, and all the like? I mean, I'm no insider, so uh, this will just be my opinion and gut feeling. I have no inclination or sources that anything will happen. I'll just start off by saying that. But look, if I was a guy that just purchased a team for $950 million and this team is on a six-year playoff drought and has not had hardly any success, I would probably make some changes as soon as I'm able to. Just like... It's, it's the saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, if it's broke, fix it. And the Senators, they've been a broken franchise for quite a while here. And I think it's going to be refreshing for fans and an organization as, as a whole to start top down and have that trickle effect go all the way throughout the organization. And Ross, honestly, I'd be shocked if we don't see at least two or three kind of big moves throughout the organization. One of them was just rumored the other day. We spoke about Sean Tierney coming on an analytics full-time employee and front office sports put out an article. Our friend Steve Warren with the hockey news put out an article about potential changes that could be coming. And I thought the final line that uh, Steve Warren wrote was, uh, I don't know if eerie or, you know, footsteps might be the right terminology, but this is a direct quote from Steve Warren. You can go read this, the hockey news.com, the Ottawa senators page. I spoke last week with a current member of the Senators hockey operations staffs. And while he continues to happily work under the status quo, he says he's not sure yet where things stand for this season. And it's almost one of those. I mean, if I was Michael Anlauer and I'm not saying that I'm not advocating for anyone to lose their jobs, but you're not going to give any inkling until the day that you pull the trigger, right? Like you you don't want them to be working under the suspicion that they're going to be gone. 
Yeah, and that's the thing too. Like, you can't do a clean sweep and fire everybody. Uh, we've seen how that worked for Elon Musk with Twitter or X, and then he's like, "Oh, wait, you guys actually do work that I need. Actually, do you want to come back and work for me?" So I don't think he's gonna do massive layoffs and just to prove a point or anything like that. I, I think he's going to pick a couple spots where he knows people with expertise that he's worked with before. I mean, the Sean Tierney, great example. He was with him uh, with the Hamilton Bulldogs. Steve Steos is the other guy rumored there. He was with him with the Bulldogs as well. Steos has already left his job in Edmonton. So assume, assuming he's available, I'm sure he's a guy that will be in consideration to be brought on. And I, th I think that's fine. I think this organization has had the same type of people running, running it and the same mindset and kind of ideologies for quite a while. And I'm not saying that's good or bad, but sometimes you, you just need change just to have some sort of shift. And especially when it's a team that hasn't been successful on the ice. I was just looking at the list of uh, Brantford right now as their Hamilton home gets renovated, but uh, looking at their list of uh, employees to be like, hey, wonder who else? Uh, former Ottawa Senator, whose son was drafted and one of the first ever guests on this show, Jonathan mm -hmm. Bruden, is the head coach of the uh, Brantford Bulldogs. Uh, just a random aside there, but I do find it interesting to look up and down different employees. And I'm not only talking like head coach, GM, that sort of thing. I'm talking, you know, guys who he's familiar with. It makes sense that when you when you come into a new organization, you want to bring people you've been successful with and been able to work together with for a common goal. So we're going to keep you posted on this as it all develops. I do find it very fascinating um, with Michael and Lauer. And everyone's just raving about Ann Lauer, by the way. Like talking about, yeah. uh, I saw Jason York and the Coming in Hot podcast discuss that Ann Lauer was the only owner, prospective owner, that asked about the alumni suite and wants to renovate it and make sure that it attracts the alumni to come back and be a part of the organization. I think that's huge going forward. Before we get to our organizational value rankings and then our Sun Central Citizen, Pilsy, the Champions Hockey League is going into its ninth season. Philip Nordberg will be playing in it this year with the Lakers. I'm not taking a stab at that. <laughs> I tried. Failed miserably. Sorry, Alex Linskog and all our other Swedes who, who love the show. So with that said, Champions Hockey League, it's like Champions League in soccer. It's teams from different countries all around Europe coming together. They play a game here, game there. And the scoring you'll notice on Elite Prospects, CHL, it's a little bit different than their regular leagues. They're making a few drastic rule changes. I want to get your take on Pilsy. Our friend Scott Wheeler tweeting them out here. So if you're watching on YouTube, I've pulled it up. I love this one. A team that takes a minor penalty will remain shorthanded for the full two minutes, even if a team scores on them. Yeah. Love it. Why should, why should you have less of an opportunity to capitalize on a team's penalty? Just cause you're so good. You scored. Like, I don't think that should give them any relief. Like, especially ones where it's like, well, I guess this is more relating to a, uh, the next rule. So I'll, I'll save it. But I do, I do like that. Cause Hey, some guys make a living off getting power play points. The last thing you want is off the face off a quick, a quick goal off uh, the, the point shot. And you're like, man, I thought I had another minute and 50 seconds of opportunity to cash in here. Seems like an easy way to get more scoring in the game. Well, and it emphasizes, Hey, how, how much of an implication can a minor penalty have? Well, you, you could pop a couple goals on just a bad uh, high-sticking play where you, you're just not responsible for your stick, and it's a bonehead play. So I think that's good. And I think that, I mean, this goes right hand-in-hand. Hand. A minor penalty will be served even if a goal is scored while a delayed penalty is pending. I mean, yeah. Like, that means that you, like, as it stands right now, you could whack a guy across the arm or, or even worse, you know, stick him between the legs, whatever the case may be. And if your team gives up a goal, you don't even have to step foot in the box. Yeah. Like it just seems like, like a strange rule. And this one's my favorite though. It's almost on the other side of it. If your power play sucks and you allow a goal, your power play is over. Agreed. Yeah. I, I think that's a good rule too, but uh, with the delayed one, like that's what I was going to get to Ross is, why should you be penalized for scoring while there's a delayed penalty and now you don't get the power play after? Like that's, that's so wild to me that ever, that ever was even a rule to begin with. Like the first one, yeah, that makes sense. But this one, like the delayed penalty one always pissed me off. And then, yeah, I think that like 
I love a good shorthanded goal. Like, I feel like it doesn't get enough emphasis. Like, a guy scores a goal and he's like, man, I got to go back to killing penalties now. Like, I got to go back to blocking shots down a man. So, yeah, I like all these rules. However, Ross, I don't anticipate we'll see the NHL uh, taking any of these rules or even considering them because that would have a drastic, drastic change in stats and, like, the, the way stats have been recorded. And I think they're sticklers when it comes to things like that. No, I understand it. Imagine though a guy scores on a shorthanded breakaway and he has so much speed. He just like turns and flies and then like goes to the penalty box and opens the door for his teammate to come out. That'd be sick. That'd be the Selly. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, great Selly. So let us know in the comments. Like, are you for or against big time changes when it would come to increasing scoring, but more naturally than, you know, making the goalie's equipment smaller, the net bigger, anything like that. This seems just like, hey, the guy took a penalty for two minutes. Why is it ending before two minutes just when one goal goes in? I want to say that the NHL used to actually make it two minutes. And then I, I want this might be, uh, you know, lost in history or lost along the chain of communication. I want to say those 50s or 60s Montreal Canadiens teams were so dominant. They would score five or six goals yeah. on power play. And then it was like, okay, well, that that's the game. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's the thing. Like, it definitely is going to change the implications of a, a penalty. But, Ross, you know who's going to have a really hard time if those rules ever did change? Who? Oh. Noodles. Noodles. Every single time there's a penalty, he says he's going to sit in the box for two or less. Like, he ne- like most people are just like, oh, well, he's got a two-minute penalty here. Noodles will never, ever say that. He always says two or less. So, that would he'd have to change his little uh, automatic one-liner there. Ooh, no pressure. Hey, we got to get noodles back on. We got a great, great list of potential guests coming up before the regular season. So make sure you smash the subscribe button and hit the like, the thumbs up underneath the video if you're watching on YouTube. Coming up next, we're going to do things a little bit differently today because the, um, how do I say this? Organizational value rankings, we're biting off a big chunk today with tier seven so we're going to get to that next and then we'll wrap up the show with our send central citizen really fun conversation coming up with matt so that's next you're listening to locked on senators today's episode is brought to you by our friends over at FanDuel, guys they are the trusted online sports book of the locked on podcast network they're north america's number one sports book pierre dorian loves winners we love winners here on locked on senators too and you can be a winner on FanDuel. you can take your first swing on major league baseball and get 10 times your first bet amount of bonus bets up to 200 bucks that's right 20 dollars bet you'll land 200 dollars in bonus bets Even if you lose, like that's a hard uh, bet not to make that you'll get bonus bucks no matter what. And it's all in an app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. And when you win, you get those green numbers in your account right away. So sign up and visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get up to $200 in bonus bets. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, official partner of Major League Baseball. Today's episode is also brought to you by the Glebe Central Pub. You can find the Glebe Central Pub right in the heart of the Glebe at 779 Bank Street. And when you go, make sure you let them know that Locked On Senators sent you. I'm on the Glebe Central Pub's Instagram right now. Glebe Central Pub, easy to find, just like it is in the heart of the Glebe. Now, you can also find all the great events that are coming up at the Glebe Central Pub on their website thegleebcentralpub.com and on Instagram. They are the perfect place to go right before Red Blacks game. If you're going shopping, it lands down on the weekend or you're just looking for good vibes. There's a really good supporter section and they're always making sure to do things interactively at the Glebe Central Pub. They got trivia night was I believe last night. I saw some posts on that. Everyone looks like they're having the best time. So you can too by going to the Glebe Central Pub. Though the send shuttle's coming back soon too. So make sure you get signed up. Glebecentralpub.com. Glebe Central Pub. Visit them on 779 Bank Street and let them know that Locked On Senator sent you tasty food, great drinks, amazing atmosphere. Go find them at 779 Bank Street. All right. Shout out to the everydayers out there that make Locked On Senators their first listen, second listen. We appreciate you guys Monday through Friday. And yeah, the network said, go back to five shows, September 15th. We said, no, we got organizational value rankings to do, guys. It's time 
to get back to five shows a week now. Yeah, we don't have time to get all the content we want out to you guys if we only did three shows a week. So we know a lot of people love the organizational value rankings. It's kind of the unofficial sign that the next season is approaching. So here we are. Let's do it. And I should... Ah, should I correct my mistake, Pills? The accounting's never been my strong suit. Um, about the tiers? Yeah. It's okay. Ross forgot that two comes after one. He went tier one to three, and that ruined uh, the rest of our tier numbering system. So we didn't have Sean Tierney available for the uh, naming of the tiers one through nine. So there was a human error there. Yeah, so we've done two tiers so far. They've both been tier nine. The first one was right. The second one wasn't. So we are on tier seven now as we enter to, uh, I would call this the intriguing tier where it's like, okay, these guys, it's not really make or break yet for them, but it's almost, you you described it as like a sophomore tier, right? We had our first tier was like unsigned, just drafted, late yeah. round picks. This tier, it's like, okay, you either, we've got one player who's made his NHL debut or no, two, because one played in the final game of the season was his first NHL game. But I think mostly you're looking at guys who are two, three years away. And with that, yeah. coming in at number 43 on our organizational value rankings, it's, I want to say, somewhat of a forgotten prospect out of Sweden. It's Oliver Johansson, who was a third-round pick back in 2021. Yeah, I would certainly say Johansson is kind of a guy that sends fans uh, gloss over just with other Swedish prospects being kind of more of the forefront of the scene. But he's over there doing his thing with, in, uh, with Timra and classic Swedish uh, prospects. He's played a handful of games in just about every league possible, um, mostly in the Allsvenskan League with 27 games, six goals, three assists, and he is, they've got him as a winger and a centerman on elite prospects, but he's a left shot guy. And he's looking to have a big season here, Ross, as he's hoping to catch the attention of more Sens fans and more notably Sens executives, upper management. And he was one of the youngest players picked in 2021. So with that, there's a bit more rope. He's a July 26th birthday, 2003. So he's 20 years old, just turned 20. And that, to me, is where this becomes a really intriguing prospect. He has not had success at the SHL level. Zero points in 20 games combined between the last two seasons. Last year, spent the majority of the year playing in the Allsvenskan, which is where the stats you mentioned are from. But he still had a little taste of his own age group in the under-20 league, where he was a point per game. Eight points, eight games, six yep. points in seven games in the playoffs. He's an offensive-minded, creative player. So I think that those guys, especially undersized as he is, I know six feet, 183, but I think he plays more of that speed perimeter type game. He's going to take, I think, a little bit longer. Now, another team rep player who never ultimately made it, but still had high hopes and who probably produced more at this level would have been Jonathan Dolan, who's back there now. Like I, I see a lot of similarities where I don't know if it's going to translate to the NHL, but he could surprise. I could see him going off this season and I could also see him getting three minutes a game and not showing a whole lot so this to me would be a pivotal year for the now 20 year old prospect yeah Ross I think this might be a year where it kind of decides whether the Sens are gonna bring him over to North America or whether he's just gonna stay in Sweden yeah you think it's it's that too I want to say he gets one more year after this one I'll say yeah, I mean, it's definitely possible, but I think that this is a big year for him. Uh, I'm hoping that he can get some consistent time playing in the Allsvenskan League and getting a good top six role there so he can kind of show what what he has in the right opportunity. Oliver Johansson is signed, or not signed, but he's unsigned. However, Ottawa holds his rights until June 1st, 2025. So no decision necessary this year, but after the following season, and they could always sign him and then reassign him if they wanted to keep him over playing yep. in Europe, but he has to have a contract by not next summer, but the year after uh, if he is going to stay in the organization. So Oliver Johansson, we'll be keeping our eye on him too old for the world juniors, but it's time to produce in men's hockey with the SHL, like Eric Engstrand, who Ottawa didn't even sign put up better numbers than he did in, in the SHL as an 18 year old. So it's just interesting that his point per game production against his own age group hasn't really transferred over. And that's why he's still in a position where he's coming in at number 43, which is three spots lower than we had him last year on our organizational value rankings.
All right, coming in at number 42 on our organizational value rankings, we are going with a player who unfortunately had last season cut way too short after an impressive start. It's Philip Dau with the Belleville Sands. Yeah, Ross, we were looking at his uh, stats earlier this morning and I was like, not only nine games played? Like I completely forgot that he had that terrible shoulder injury that just ended his season uh, footy tweeted out uh, the season's over after that, unfortunately for him. And it's really too bad Ross, because in nine games, he had two goals and five assists, like seven points in nine games. That's a, such a hot start for a young centerman. And in a, a team, even a franchise that was short centerman. So he would have had a chance to have an elevated role. Whereas now, I'm sure I haven't heard, but I'm sure he's totally ready to go and hundred percent and he's going to have a good season, but there is a lot of competition up the middle in this organization now, particularly in Belleville. Like we did kind of a quick uh, projected roster for Belleville and Dau kind of, he ends up in the bottom six, maybe even as a fourth line center, just because of the veteran centers they brought in and paid big, big minor league dollars to. So We'll see what kind of role he gets here, but maybe he shifts to the wing. That's something we could see. I'm not sure. Great playmaker. He's a guy who yep. sees the ice really well. He's got a long stick and is able to kind of, you know, dial it in. I think hockey IQ is probably one of his bigger strengths uh, throughout. And we thought we saw his first ever goal in his first ever AHL game when yeah. we were in Laval Pilsy. Turns out it got tipped, so he got an assist, and then he never scored again. And that was in the first game of the year. He played 15 games, five assists, and I think that they did the right thing by sending him back to yeah. St. John in the QMJHL where he just, I mean, the QMJHL, it's the all points league, uh, 47 points in 38 games there. They got bounced in the first round of the playoffs, but they hosted the Memorial Cup where he played a lot better. And that's impressive after two months off, right? They had to wait for the whole playoffs to go through. He had six points in four games at the Memorial Cup, all assists. So uh, noticing a bit of a trend here, big time playmaker. And he's a guy where, yeah, he might be on the fourth line, but he's a guy where if a guy gets hurt in the top six, I feel like his skill set can bounce around. So I'm really intrigued with with uh, Philip Dau. He's also uh, just 21 years old. He'll be 22, though, in November, but he'll start the year as a 21-year-old. And for a sixth-round pick, Pilsy, I think that he's, he's showing that slow and steady growth, and obviously the injury held him back a little bit, but still a guy who's got a ton of skill offensively, and I think he could be an interesting piece of the organization moving forward. Yeah, I'm definitely interested in uh, Dau, that's for sure. And I just hope that he doesn't get too buried in Belleville's lineup because I know, like some some people might be saying, well, Pilsy, you're always talking about bringing veterans in and not having it just a team of prospects. Now, now I'm complaining about too many veterans and not enough uh, opportunity for prospects. But there's got to be that balance. I mean, unfortunately, injuries do happen, so I'm sure he's going to get those opportunities. But this could be a big year for Dau, and I hope he gets set up with line mates that can complement his skills. He's been in our organizational value rankings for all four years. He was 55th. Oh, wow. Then he was 55th. Then he was 37th after a really strong JHL. And now down five spots, he comes in at number 42 on this year's rankings. Coming in at number 41, his second year on the list. It's a third round pick from last year's NHL draft 2022. It's Tomas Hamara of the Kitchener Rangers. Yep, Tomas Hamara. Uh, we got a lot of insight on him from our good friend Sean Fafaro, the Rangers uh, host for Rogers TV. And look, this is a guy I was very excited about when the Sens drafted him. I labeled him as one of my guys. Uh, he was one of the top point getters of rookie defensemen in the OHL in the preseason. Now, obviously, I put like three different uh, implications on that stat, but I mean, still impressive nonetheless. And he did start off his OHL debut season pretty hot. But then, Ross, I was looking at his game logs and something happened uh, in the World Juniors that, I mean, he only had one assist. Mind you, it was in the final game. So that's a good time to show up if you're going to show up at all points wise. But when he came back to the OHL from World Juniors, he only had six points in his last 32 games. Like this is a guy that's a puck moving defenseman and he had a decent role uh, from what I understand with the Rangers and six points in 32 games to finish off your season. That's, that's a tough way to close things off. 
his world junior to me was kind of uh unfortunately punctuated with a couple of brutal giveaways yeah. on robin and, and just like you know decision making where you got and that's something that can be cleaned up over over time and i think the development staff wade redden who better to work with yeah uh, than wade redden when it comes to being a puck moving left shot defenseman who's always looking to make plays up ice i think tamash amara needs to you know take some momentum and a lot of video i think from last year of playing with kitchener and not always great team and i'm going to give him benefit of the doubt here too of moving over and playing on the small ice for the first time and having less time and space and all these different things that can attribute to maybe not the best year for him but he, at least he gets to go home with a silver medal as czechia won silver at the world juniors just losing in overtime to canada yeah. in the finals ottawa clearly high on hamara giving him that contract after his first training camp with the Senators, so he's already a signed prospect, but he's also one I think that the Senators need to see a step forward in the right direction this season. He's down five spots for us, Pilsy. He's uh, he's in at 41 right now. We're a little bit higher on him last year, but still there is a very realistic ceiling that he could get to as like, not to compare him to an exact guy, but like if he could be a Chris Weidman, I think would be a very good, you know, ultimate goal for him to reach. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think he's... He's going to have opportunities and now he's got a season under his belt. Like it's always interesting to see how guys do in their sophomore season in the OHL, especially European guys, like you mentioned, new ice surface. The My main thing for him, Ross, is going to be, we got to clean up that plus minus. I mean, at minus 21, we did Michael a Andonovsky a little while ago. Matthew. Kitchen, or sorry, Matthew Andonovsky. Apologies. Um, and he was a plus 25 on the Kitchener Rangers. Same team. Same team. So, like, that's that's a big, big difference between those guys. Now, obviously, he it, it wasn't wasn't Ando's first season in the OHL, so you got a little more experience there. But my Same main – yeah, my main thing for Hamara is going to be let's, let's clean up those turnovers and try to get closer to even on plus minus. So maybe do less is more. Well, yeah, because that's the thing, Ross. You mentioned the turnovers in World Juniors, and those mostly came from him – being in a bad spot and feeling the pressure to make a big play when he could have just skated up the ice rather than try to send a saucer pass across the middle in front of his own net, right? Things like that where maybe you're so much pressure to put up points and to move the puck up that you try to do too much when you can do a safer play that will give your team a better opportunity to set up the play later. The good news is that Tomas Hamara is only 19, yeah. And won't turn 20 until March. So he's already been at the World Juniors twice, and he'll be back there again this year. Third time. So there's still a long way and to that's go. a good Czechia team. Like, that's that's a big deal for him. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to seeing the growth of Tomas Shamara, who is down five spots on our list. He comes in at number 41 after making his debut at 36 last year on the Locked On Senators organizational value rankings. All right, coming up after a quick break, we're going to get back to this list even further. And Ascend Central Citizen, it is a packed Wednesday show for you. You're listening to Locked On Senators. All right, thanks for making Locked On Senators your first listen. Please smash the like button, hit subscribe. Steal your partner's phone, your friend's phone, your mom's phone, your dad's phone, and subscribe to the show. It really does keep us motivated here and to give you daily content. Bonus points if you steal your Leafs fans' friends' phones, your Habs fans' send, uh, friends' phones, and they're like, whoa, locked on, I've subscribed to Locked On Senators, and I've downloaded 30 episodes? What the heck? Bonus points if you can pull that off. Heck yeah. <laughs> now for a guy who wants to be in Ottawa. He has to want to be in Ottawa. It's his hometown, and with that, Coming in at number 40 on our organizational value rankings is Donovan Sobrango, one of the newer prospects on the organization. He was drafted a few years ago. Yeah, sure. But he came over in the Alex DeBrinket trade. What can fans expect from number 55? Well, Donovan Sobrango, uh, again, I'll reference Sean Fafaro uh, saying that when he was added to the Alex Dabrinkit deal to come to Ottawa, I think a lot of us were like, oh, that's like a, a throw-in prospect. Like, not not to put him down or anything, but when you're looking at a deal that involves Alex Dabrinkit and there's a guy like that, you're like, oh, that was just a throw-in. And Sean was adamant, like, no, this guy's got a lot of potential. And he's someone the people that saw him play in Kitchener really believe in. High character guy. It's no surprise for the Ottawa Senators targeting guys like that. But 
I really don't know where he's going to fit in here, Ross. That's the tough thing. Like we mentioned with Dao, like a guy in his early 20s that has some AHL experience. Well, Sabrango has a lot more AHL experience. Uh, just scrolling down here. He's got 135 games of AHL experience as a 21-year-old already. But he did spend 23 games in the ECHL last season. And with the guys that the Ottawa Senators have on defense, it's not going to be easy for him to carve out a consistent role here, in my opinion. Yeah, when you look at the left side of the defense in Belleville, like is Tyler Clevin going to be there? And if so, then all of a sudden you have Dylan Hetherington and Jacob Larson. Yeah. Those two vets making a ton of money in the AHL. Well, we talked about it yesterday. Uh, I want to say it's like 400,000, 350. Yeah, I think Hetherington is making 400 and uh, Larson's making 300. So, right. oh, yeah. that's a lot to, to ask a, a kid to, to overshadow. Now, Sabrango's six foot one, 194 pounds, more of a shutdown, like big, you know, great skating defenseman. And at least like, he didn't struggle in the ECHL, much like right. another guy we're going to talk about uh, later today on this list. When he went down to the ECHL, he proved that he was going to be the best player on the ice. 12 points in 23 games, plus 11 rating um, for him. Had uh, seven points in 39 games last year in Grand Rapids. He's got two years left on his contract at $828,000. And again, one of the guys who it's like, we, we don't know what we're going to get with Donovan Sabrango. So I think that for him, come into camp with a, with everyone having an open mind about him and understanding that he kind of got screwed with COVID, right? He, the OHL didn't start up, yeah. so he turned pro at 18, which is why he has that many games played despite only being a 21-year-old kid until January. So I'm excited to see Donovan Sabrango. I think that there is a potential there. And I think for the, for more on Sabrango, we'll point you towards our interview with Sean Fafaro earlier this offseason. I think he gave a glowing review, so yeah. we want to leave it with that with Donovan Sabrango who makes his debut on our OVR at number 40 coming in at number 39 on our organizational value rankings. People chuckled when the senators took him. Why? Cause his dad is the player development guy for Ottawa. What's he done since strung together back to back impressive years in the Ontario hockey league. He's earned a contract from the Ottawa senators and what's next for Jory and Donovan. Well, he had just an incredible season uh, with the Hamilton Bulldogs. And f funny enough, we talked earlier in the episode, Ross, about Ann Lauer owning the Bulldogs and now son of uh, Ottawa Senators employee is there. So he's got connections to Ottawa. I mean, he, he's, uh, he's definitely a player that even without those connections, the Ottawa Senators would typically like left shot defensemen. And putting up 45 points in 55 games as a defenseman, it's pretty damn impressive. Like, I was trying to think, what like what more would I want from Jory and Donovan Ross? And I can only come up with a couple nitpicking things. Like, again, plus minus, not to be all end all, but a minus nine. You don't love to see that, especially when you're putting up big points. So you'd like to clean that up a bit. And he, of his 12 goals, only one of them were on the power play. So maybe try to pot a couple more on the man advantage. I'm sure he's the top guy there as he was the leading defenseman for the Bulldogs in points. So he's got the opportunities for sure. So very minor things. Like, honestly, Ross, I think... He's just got to look at this as this is probably his last season in the OHL. Go stay, stay there, dominate, and then get ready for your pro season. Elite prospects just put out the Senators uh, or draft prospect or prospect rankings. And they have Jordan Donovan as like a C prospect, they call it. But they also say that he is the type of prospect, direct quote, is the kind of prospect that development teams want to work with. His tools all project as NHL caliber or better. For him, it's just a matter of figuring out how to maximize his potential. And doing that, he's skating with Shelly Kettles all summer. He's been in those groups with the Eric Carlson's, Mark Stones, and the guys who train in Ottawa as I shed one single tear down my cheek hearing that. But, hey, he's practicing like Tarasenko's out there. All these guys. And now he's going back to the OHL. This should be a dominant year. You know what I'm going to set the goal for Jory and Donovan at this year? Tear. Make it impossible for Team Canada to leave you off the World Junior Team. Yeah, I like that. For a fifth-round pick, I, it won't be like heartbreaking if he doesn't make it, but if he can force his way onto that team, be a huge step in the right direction for Jory and Donovan, who last year came in on this list as a debut, 46th, and now he's 39th on our organizational value rankings. Coming in at number 
38 on our rankings, a player who just did an interview with us about a month ago. So we're all on board the mythical creature that is Philip Nordberg, 6'5", hulking figure. And man, he impressed with his hands for us in front of development camp. Yeah, it was great to meet Nordberg in person. Like you really get an idea of the size. Oh, Jake. Yeah, this is a strong, big kid, that's for sure. Uh, he's very soft-spoken. Uh, he seems like a guy that, uh, you know, gets gets along with everyone. He had a really good nature, and him and Pistol Pete seemed to be good buddies as well. And look, Philip Nordberg, it was great to see him on the ice, too, because it, it was hard to find video of him before, hence why we penned him the mythical creature. And he impressed me out there, like not only with his size, but also he had a couple dangles up his sleeve that we were not prepared for. So I'm very excited to watch the progression of Philip Norberg. And this year he's going to play in the SHL full time. Last year he bounced around. I joked with him. I was like, you wore like 45 jerseys last year. Yeah. Like, did you keep them all? He actually played last year in J20 hockey all Svenskin for two different teams yep. and the SHL and with Team Sweden's U19 team and with Team Sweden's U20 team. Oh, this year, hopefully, it's just in the SHL and maybe, maybe with the World Junior Team. He's going to be 19 until March 5th, so he does have that opportunity, but Sweden is also loaded on the back end. He's 6'5", 212, so brings that in aspect to his game as well. Great skater. For him, it's just making smart decisions consistently and getting out some of those warts and giveaways in his game. But, man, the physical package that you're getting in Nordberg like, just projects to be an NHL or at some point now is he Andreas England at the NHL or is he a Marcus Peterson and the NHL for the Pittsburgh Penguins where he's able to use that size that reached his advantage and be a shutdown defenseman so I'm I'm excited David St. Louis from Elite Prospects uh, DM me yesterday saying hey out of all the players that we watched right now I was really surprised by Nordberg looked a lot better this season keep an eye on him so you know what David I will yeah, and like Nordberg, where he's going to have success isn't going to be on the stat sheet. It's going to be about doing all of those little things, using your size for good gap control, making it impossible to get around you, winning those battles in the corners, boxing out guys in front. It's going to be those little things that maybe fans uh, that don't watch him aren't really excited about when they look him up, but things that coaches are going to love, and he's going to put himself in good opportunities to succeed. And just a likable guy. Pierre Dorian mentioned to us that he was very impressed getting to meet him for the first time. So we'll keep an eye on Philip Nordberg. Last year, Nordberg was 35th. So he's moved down three spots. And again, centers have added talent. So that pushes a lot of guys down a little bit, but not the next guy on this list. But Nordberg, yes, comes in at number 38. All right, coming in at number 37 on our organizational value rankings, the next two both had an NHL games experience this year. This guy was in the final game of the season, but it was a well-earned victory for a great season in Belleville. Maxence Gannett is coming in at 37. Yeah, Max Gannett is a guy that's been an exciting prospect to follow for quite a while here, Ross says. When he was in the queue, he was putting up pretty good numbers for a defenseman. And when he went to Belleville, he seemed to kind of seamlessly transition into the pro league here and especially last year like you look at his stats and 72 games five goals 35 assists for 40 points and I didn't really think that he has an opportunity to be the Belleville Senators top right shot defenseman I, I don't think it's out of the question that he can seize that opportunity and what's interesting, because I think people who will agree with you will be like oh yeah like Lassie Thompson's had his opportunity blah 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 these guys were from the same draft. The only difference is Lassie Thompson went in the first round and Max Gannett went in the seventh round, 187th overall. So he's just been able to slow and steady, show his growth to the point now where he had 40 points last season, leading all Belleville Sens defensemen. He's going into a contract year. He's going to want to show well. And at six foot three and a right shot defenseman, he's got some of the tools that you look for in the National Hockey League. So I'm very excited to see what's next for Max Gannett. I think he needs a big training camp. And re remember after he got drafted, they put him with Thomas Shabbat almost as like a, hey, let this guy show you around type thing. And I think that he's kind of taken a little bit of Thomas Shabbat's game with him, the distribution ability, all that. And I think Gannett is going to be the power play quarterback down there in Belleville as well this year. And I'm excited to see what he does. 
Yeah, I I think the main thing for Gannett is I want to see him playing on a pair with Dylan Hetherington or Jacob Larson. Get him with a big, responsible veteran defenseman on the left side and let him cook on the right side. Let let it every time that puck's coming into Belleville zone and they're going to break it out in transition. I want Max Gannett being that guy. Like I really think that David Bell can put a lot more responsibility on him this season. And I think he can rise to that challenge. And he's not just an offensive defenseman. I think his one-on-one defending is as good. Elite prospects mentioned that in their write-ups as well. Just being like, he's engaging. He's good with his stick. He can defend well like that. It's just a matter of his read sometimes in the defensive zone, more so away from the puck. We'll see if he can build on that. But Max yeah. Gannett, man, he earned his spot on this list at 37. He's up seven spots from last nice. year. Chelsea. Another guy who's been on the list all four seasons. He went from 43 to 44 to 44 to 37. So now he's up right now at 37. All right, coming in at number 36 on our Locked On Senators organizational value rankings is friend of the show, goaltender Kevin Mandelazy. Yep, Mando coming in here, and uh, wow, what an interesting season for Kevin Mandelazy last year. Like I think that's fair to say, as he got a, he was basically a Swedish prospect. He got a taste of all three levels of competition here in North America. But anytime you get to say you played in an NHL game, I would say that's a success. Let alone get a win and play in three total games. So Mando had a year that he can kind of look back on and he can kind of take different things from his different experiences in the ECHL, AHL, and NHL. Just turned 23 years old, Mando did. And I think when you're looking at what he can bring next season, it's that experience from playing in the ECHL, playing nine playoff games down there as well. And, you know, Dylan Ferguson came in and did a good job, played well in Belleville. And I think them giving Mando the confidence saying, hey, we we drafted and developed you. Yep. We still see a lot of potential. And remember, this guy was the QMJHL goaltender of the year. He's He's got a track record of providing results. His athleticism is, is I'd say, probably the best among goalie prospects in the organization. Like, you look at Mads, obviously, brings a lot of intangibles and and uh, with his size and, and moving around like that. But in terms of, like, that classic Quebecois style, like that butterfly, go down low, he's 6'5", big, big frame. I think that he he brings a lot of, of, of very impressive tools to his toolbox. So I'm excited to see what Mando can do growing here. When you look last season, the numbers weren't the best in the AHL. That 890 save percentage uh, kind of sticks out a bit. But look at the save percentage at the NHL level, 916. Those aren't just, like, gimme games. He was second half of back-to-back on Long Island, second half of back-to-back with travel again in Boston. And then after Ottawa lost in uh, Chicago, then in Vancouver, I know they got the win in Seattle. It's like, all right, okay, we got a back-to-back again in Edmonton and Calgary. All right, go get them, kid. Well, a 916 save percentage I think is pretty impressive. And then the ECHL 927, like too good for that level. But there's a chance he has to play there again this year, Pilsy, just based on numbers. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's not going to be easy for Mando. He's going to have to be in a goalie trio of Mad Sogard himself and then Levy Marilainen. And I think Levy Marilainen, he's got got something to prove. He also got some time in the NHL. He got a taste of the AHL. And I think he's going to want to come over here as a guy that was a star in Liga, professional league in Finland. He's not just going to kind of give up his job uh, as a backup in Belleville. I think it's safe to say that Mads will be the number one guy there. So Mando and Marilyn, and that's going to be some healthy competition that I'm very interested to see how it goes. I think Ross for Mando, I want to see him get more than 20 games uh, in the AHL. Both uh, he's had 17 games, 17 games and nine seasons have some consistency in the AHL and uh, hopefully he can have a healthy season and provide good competition in that crease. For more on what goes on between Mando's ears, go check out our interview with uh, with Mando from just a month ago. Really fun conversation with him. Easy guy to root for. And that's where Kevin Mandelazy comes in after a historic NHL debut. Only two goalies in NHL history have made more saves than Mando did in his first game on Long Island. You can go to our social media. We put the excuse me, put together a little video clip of both him and Mads talking about that special night. In 2020, Matt Mando was 41st. In 2021, he was 40th, then then 42nd, and now he's up six spots to 30. There we go. So Mando comes in at number 36 on our organizational value rankings. All right, Pilsy, let's get to this week's Send Central Citizen. Here is Matthew. 
All right, we now welcome on this week's Send Central Citizen. We're excited to have Matt on the show. You can follow Matt on Twitter at SendsFan111. Welcome to Locked On Senators. Thanks for doing this. Hey, not a problem. Really, really excited to have you, man. You look like you've got the whole setup there. When did you become a Sens fan, Matt? I became a Sens fan right at the uh, the beginning of them becoming a team in 92. Nice. Uh, what uh, Were you a fan of a different team before and you hopped yeah, ship? Yeah, I was or... a fan of the uh, uh, 93, uh, what is it, Canadians. Okay. The one that won the cup. Yep. Yeah. Who... At the time, who would wasn't a fan right then because that team was spectacular? Didn't Ottawa beat them in their first game that year? <laughs> yeah, though they did. <laughs> there you go. When was I know I was at the Civic Center when that happened. Yeah, what are your memories from that day? It, it's hard to remember. It's 30, uh, 31 years ago, so <laughs> easier for you than me. I was one month old. <laughs> What were some of the earliest players that you followed along with as a Sens fan? Well, I was a huge Alfie fan. Nice. I a lot of the goalies I really liked. I liked Yane Herme. Nice. Uh, some of the players that actually should have made the team, I think I've I was a huge fan of like uh, Zubov and uh, Stefan DeCosta one of France's <laughs> best players now. So what about let's let's speed up to today's team. What are you feeling about the excitement going into this season? Oh, I'm charged. And I can't believe people aren't excited about Kubalik. Okay. I've seen Kubalik play with players like Patrick Kane. He can give the better numbers than what everybody's thinking he can give. He is a sniper. Let's hear, let's hear a hot take from you then. How do you think Kubelik's going to finish this season? For about 30 goals at least. At least 30? Say, All right. Who, who do you got sure. him playing with? What line? I do see it could be a, still a third line because, yeah. let's face it, those first two lines seem like they'll definitely be killer. So 30 goals from the third line. I'll be impressed. Well, no, yeah, from Kubelik at least because... If Pinto signs, him and Kubelik could be a really a good match. Yeah. Last year, the problem was a bit of consistency in Detroit. He would start strong, and then throughout the year, it just felt like the offense went down and down and down. But maybe in the right situation, he can't because he, he has scored 30 before. So it's not like we're looking at a situation where he's never done this. So I do think that's a hot take, and we appreciate hot takes on our Send Central Citizen segment. But – that's that's spicy right there, Matthew. <laughs> hey, that's solid. So you you like the Kubalik signing? How do you feel about Tarasenko? Oh, very happy about that. Yeah. Uh, let's face it. Even though the Rangers are a good team, he didn't have exactly the greatest players around him. Now that he's in Ottawa, he has a very highly skilled young team to feed off what he was able to do in uh, St. Louis. Yeah, I, I hope he can get back to those St. Louis days, especially, I don't know about you, Matt, but I got Tarasenko playing on that top line with Brady and Timmy. So there's not much better situation you can be put in to score goals and playing with those two guys. Oh, yeah. Or even the, if you match him with uh, Batherson and uh, G, that would be pretty killer too. So, Matt, do you end up getting out to many games? When's the last Sens game you went to? Oh, actually, I'm a season ticket holder for nice. three or four years. There you go. So I you... usually sit in, like, the 300 areas. Yeah. What's your favorite place to watch the game? Uh, Is there a section you like, like the viewpoint? Yeah, well, no, I think there's not really a bad seat in the uh, in the building. It's true. It's yeah. so much fun to be in that building, especially with that uh, run last year. Did you go to the home opener? Yep. How fun was that? Oh, it was epic. <laughs> especially the uh, band that played. It was just, it was insane. Yeah, uh, we're, we're they, excited for this home opener. They were great. You're coming to the home opener this year? Definitely. 
my oh, guy. of course, Matt's coming to the home opener <laughs> this year. Yeah. Um. So I, I see you got some bobbleheads behind you. What are What are we working with there? I love bobbleheads. I got to get me some more sends ones. Alfie and Carl. Nice. That's that's a good combo to have right there. Yeah. <laughs> Alfie's one of my favorite all time, and Carl's pretty good. I was never. I met him and I wasn't a fan of his personality, but he he was definitely an amazing player when he was a senator. Good enough to get a bobblehead, I'd say. Hey, uh, for final question sure. from me, Matt, and I, I saw right when we started recording, you said that you were lucky enough to also meet Daniel Alfredson. He signed something for you? Signed this jersey. Uh, yeah, I have my... Is it? I can show you it. Yeah, let's spin that thing around. Let's get a little show and tell. Subscribe on YouTube. Like and subscribe. He's rocking the century. <laughs> He's rocking the Yeah, to Chuck Sure. There we go. Full time oh, moment. Oh, okay. <laughs> there we go. Nice. Number seven. There we go. That's awesome. How many points is Brady Kachuk going to get this year? I don't know. The, the sky's the limit for him. Uh, he's strong. He's fast. He's a great leader. It's hard to say because he, he's just, the sky's the limit. He has a high ceiling. Oh yeah. All right. Let's see that Alfie. So signature. right there nice. is Daniel Alfredson's, uh, signature. That's awesome. Yeah. That's, that's a good one for sure. So since oh, I know I got it. Uh, this kid was trying to get his stick signed and all these older uh, people were kind of shoving him and uh, he wasn't able to get his stick signed. Oh, so what I did is I shoved my way into the front with his stick and I, cause I told the kid, okay, I'll get your stick signed. Nice. He asked Daniel Alfredson says, Oh, it's kind of you to do that. So then what he did is he said, so, uh, Matt, would you like something? Well, I did. Uh, yeah, I said my name was Matt to him. Anyway, he said, Matt, so do you want to uh, have anything signed? And I said, sure, I have a jersey. Would you like to sign it? Nice. He said, okay. There you go. Yeah. Class act all yeah. the way. There you go. You're rewarded for helping that kid out. Now, speaking of jerseys, I see you got the black O jersey and then you got the old uh, Senator's white one above you. What's going to be your next uh, jersey purchase? Tell me which jersey and who's going to be on it. Probably the black one with uh, Sanderson. Nice. Okay. I like that. Any reason why? Jake Sanderson is one of my favorite uh, players currently. Uh, he had he, again, like like a lot of our young players, he has so much potential, and he's so good. I've I actually did pay or um, look at the highlights before he was drafted, and or I mean when he was drafted, I watched on YouTube, and he, the kid's unreal. He can he can skate. He can uh, deke, he can shoot, and he's very good on the power play. Yep. Yeah, he's he's an all around weapon. How much fun is he? Is he one of those guys that's better when you're live when you get to see him at your? Oh season? yeah, definitely. My uh, father in law is a Leaf fan, and he was watching a preseason game with uh, my wife, and he was impressed. He was telling me how how much he was impressed with uh, Jake Sanderson. Go follow Matt on Twitter. Sends fan one, one, one sends fan one, one, one Matt. Appreciate you being a citizen, man. We will see you on October 14th at the home opener. Awesome. Cheers. Stick taps to Matthew for joining us. Really fun conversation with him. Make sure you're following him on Twitter. All right, Pilsy, any final thoughts on today's show? Final thoughts for me is all time. LOSP moment when Matt takes off the Sens jersey to reveal he's wearing a Sens t-shirt under the Sens jersey with a Sens toque on like that. Ross's face is priceless. Uh, LOSP memes, if you're listening, you got to come up with some sort of uh, 
WWE wrestling type commentary mixed with uh, that video of some some form. You, you'll figure something out, but there there's definitely a meme to be had there. As that was hilarious. There absolutely is. For me, I'll just recap today's uh, organizational value rankings tier seven. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see how it's all progressed throughout the years. Um, we've got Oliver Johansson at 43, Philip Dau at 42, Tomas Hamara at 41. Donovan Sabrango at 40. Then into the 30s, we go 39, Jory and Donovan, 38, Philip Nordberg, 37, Max Gannett, and 36, Kevin Mandelazy. If there are any organizational value rankings that you missed this weekend, I will be posting each one individually. And yes, I'm going to turn off the notification bell because you don't need, the people. You don't need 30 notifications. I don't even know if there's a maximum YouTube videos you can post in a day, but I just want them we'll all to because throughout the season, it'd be kind of fun if a guy does something. It's like, hey, what did we think of them going yep. into the season? And how has that changed throughout? So that's all next on Locked On Senators. But tomorrow, we've got an entire another tier. Because there are no days off here. But this one's a shorter tier. It's the NHL depth tier. Guys who are either going to make an impact or who are on their way out. So stay tuned for all that. For today, we say goodbye. For Brandon Piller, I'm Ross Levitan. This has been the Locked On Senators podcast. Your team every day.